All right, so we're going to cover some basics on um, lab interpretation. So uh, anytime you get a, a metabolic panel, um, one of the things I always like to do is just get a snapshot really quick and, and pull out the Chem 7 and then also some of my blood work. And then, of course, you can go deeper and look at the other um, <clears throat> uh, findings on the lab panel to, to confirm, uh, you know, a buttress, but what you might uh, be thinking happening. So we're just going to go through and, and take a brief look at each one of these, because some of them we've already talked about, including electrolytes and then also the acid-base balance. And so when we look at sodium, um, sodium increases and decreases. So a true sodium increase, where just sodium sodium is, is trending up by itself, is is, is fairly uncommon. Uh, you're not going to have somebody typically that just ingests a lot of salt and then and then that raises their uh, milliosmals um, above, you know, very high. Usually when you see sodium increasing, uh, what you're actually seeing is hemoconcentration of sodium. And so when you're looking at sodium, um, you always want to look at what BUN and also hematocrit are doing also. So let's say, for example, I take my blood, I'm gonna centrifuge it here, and so here's my blood. What I've got down here is I've got my hematocrit, and let's say that hematocrit is adult male at 45%. That leaves me plasma at 55%, okay? So, you know, normally my range for sodium is 135 to 145. But let's say, for example, that my sodium was 150, all right? So there's a couple things I can think. At 150, one thing I might think is, well, it could be that I'm releasing, I have hyperaldosteronism. And so you'll see this in Cushing's. And so with hyperaldosteronism, what's happening is I'm having an increased reabsorption of sodium down here in the tubule cells. And we'll look at this in just a bit. Um, but usually if I'm going to have an increased sodium absorption, so if I have sodium out here and I'm increasing aldosterone and forming those sodium leak channels, at the same time I'm forming potassium leak channels. So with hyperaldosteronism as an endocrine driver, you're not only going to see um, sodium increase, but potassium decrease as I, as I start to um, secrete uh, potassium out into the, in the lumen. So usually if, if sodium is going up, what I'm going to do is I'm looking at my BUN and my hematocrit. Now, uh, BUN is 10 to 20, but if BUN, let's say, went up to 25, uh, then, then what I'm looking at maybe is that I'm dropping my plasma volume. And so now I'm hemoconcentrating the sodium, so it's gone up. I'm hemoconcentrating the BUN, and it's gone up. And then the last thing I look at is hematocrit. Because if my plasma volume drops, let's say this drops to 45, then this goes to 55. And so then I know that, you know, it's not that sodium is going up. It's just that I'm hemoconcentrating sodium because I'm verifying it with these other measurements. Um, likewise with a uh, decrease uh, in, in um, sodium. So let's say instead of going up to 100 and, uh, 150, that what happened is that sodium is trending down. So once again, I want to consider, is this a true decrease in sodium or am I hemodiluting it? So let's say that it goes to 130. So the question I ask myself is, is well, what are the endocrine disorders that can cause this? Well, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease can cause hypoaldosteronism. Uh, and so with, with a low secretion of aldosterone, I'm not going to get my sodium channel, and so my sodium levels will drop. But once again, if I'm not getting my sodium channel, I'm not getting my potassium channel. So with hypoaldosteronism, sodium is going down, but potassium is trending up along with that. If potassium is not moving, then I'm thinking, well, I'm probably hemodiluting my, my, uh, my sodium. So instead of dropping my plasma volume this direction, I'm moving my plasma volume up, which is, which is causing hemodilution here. And so to verify that, I'm going to look at my BUN. If my BUN is, is let's say, 8, um, I might not right away think that that's a liver dysfunction. I might think that that's just hemodilution. And then I'm going to just look at my hematocrit too and kind of verify with that. And so a hematocrit might go from 45 to 35 because I went from 30, 65 here, which left me 35% uh, here. And so once again, my sodium, my BUN, and my hematocrit are, are agreeing whether it's uh, hemodiluting or hemoconcentrating. So once again, when you look at sodium, um, rule out uh, endocrine drivers as far as the hypoaldosteronism with um, Addison's and the hyperaldosteronism with Cushing's, and then look at your other indicators to see if, if sodium is either being hemoconcentrated or hemodiluted. Typically, it's a change in volume status that's changing uh, the sodium. All right, and then with potassium, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm thinking about my drivers uh, for potassium. And so once again, I'm looking at aldosterone. We're going to go into more detail on aldosterone here in just a minute. 
Um, now, the other things that can cause uh, potassium to go down is uh, we've talked about insulin because if I if my insulin if my potassium levels at the 3.5 mill equivalents and I'm given a large dose of insulin, insulin is going to activate those sodium potassium ATPase pumps, and then what's going to happen is I'm going to pull potassium out of the um, extracellular fluid, and so your body really tries to tightly regulate potassium. So where my sodium is 135 to 145 mill equivalents, my potassium tends to be 3.5 to 5.0. Now, if I ingest, if I, if, let's say I ate a, a baked potato and a bowl of spinach, that's gonna really take my mill equivalents per liter of potassium up. Uh, my body wants to maintain that potassium because potassium increase can actually uh, increase resting membrane potential. And so first you're gonna notice hyperreflexia as resting membrane potential moves to threshold, but then when it reaches threshold, you'll actually see that, that, um, uh, uh, that you actually have a hyporeflexive um, reaction where you're not reacting because your resting membrane potential is at threshold. So basically, anytime I take in potassium, there's a couple things that happen. First, potassium stimulates my pancreas to release insulin. Insulin then um, activates the ATPase pumps, which pulls the potassium inside the cell. Now the next thing that's going to happen on pulse away is that potassium is going to go over here to the zona glomerulosa. So if you remember on top of the kidney, we have the adrenal gland. And so in the adrenal gland, we have the adrenal medulla and the adrenal medulla right here. What it's doing is it's releasing the catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine. But I have three zones in the cortex. And so I have the zona glomerulosa, which is the outermost layer, and then the fasciculata, and then the reticularis. And so the zona glomerulosa is responsive, uh, it produces the mineral corticoid aldosterone. And so one of the primary drivers of aldosterone synthesis is extracellular potassium. So if I were to increase extracellular potassium, let's say I bumped it up, um, I'm going to start to take potassium through what's called a task channel. It's just a, a tandem um, poor acid sensitive uh, potassium channel. So potassium comes in, and as it does, it actually takes my resting membrane potential and it raises it enough to open these T-type calcium channels. So now I have calcium coming in um, to the cell. Well, calcium is the stimulus for steroidogenesis. And so once calcium comes in, that is going to stimulate steroidogenesis of aldosterone. So now I'm going to start to um, synthesize my aldosterone. Okay, and that's my mineral corticoid. Now, there's two other drivers for um, steroidogenesis of aldosterone on the zona glomerulosa. So the other two receptors I have is I have an AT1 receptor. So AT1 stands for angiotensin, so it's an angiotensin 1 receptor. So when I produce angiotensin, angiotensin 2 plugs into the AT1 receptor. The result is that it activates a GQ protein. GQ protein activates phospholipase C. That activates IP3. IP3 plugs into my IP3 receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, and I release calcium. And calcium stimulates aldosterone synthesis. The other driver um, for, for um, steroidogenesis of aldosterone is going to be ACTH. And so ACTH is your stress hormone. And so usually ACTH is going to go to the zona fasciculata and stimulate the release of cortisol. However, we do have these MC2R receptors on, um, or these MC2 receptors on the zona glomerulosa. So when ACTH plugs in here, it activates adenylene cyclase, which increases cyclic AMP. And that increase in cyclic AMP acts as your second messenger to activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylates the opening of the L-type calcium channels. And so now I have calcium coming into the L-type calcium channel, and once again, I've increased my calcium levels. So the function of all that is just to increase aldosterone. So if I come back over here, this is a principal cell. This is located in the distal convoluted tubule and then also the late VCT. But these principal cells, what they'll do is they'll respond to aldosterone. So when aldosterone diffuses out of the blood into the cell, it's going to go into the nucleus. Um, well, it's going to bind with the mineral corticoid receptor in the cytoplasm and then go into the nucleus and open a gene site. That gene is going to synthesize a, a sodium channel for sodium to come in, a potassium channel for potassium to go out. It's also going to stimulate the synthesis of a sodium-potassium ATPase pump so I can actually kick sodium out of the cell and drive potassium into the cell. So I go back to the bolus of potassium I ate. 
what happened again is insulin activated the ATPase pumps on body cells, pulled potassium out of the extracellular fluid into, into the inside of the cell. And then in the meantime, potassium um, went through the task channels on the zona glomerulosa, stimulated steroidogenesis, aldosterone comes over and it starts taking the potassium that's still out in the extracellular fluid and it brings it um, into the cell and then it, it lets it leave out through these uh, potassium um, leak channels which drives down the extracellular fluid and then allows potassium to move back out of the cell through um, leak channels on the different cells. So whenever I think of potassium and it's increasing or decreasing, you know, the things I want to ask myself um, are, you know, what's happening over here in terms of what controls uh, potassium. Now, of course, there's other things outside of this that can control potassium. So one of the things I want to start to think about is what diuretics my, my client might be on. And so potassium, it could be blocking that sodium potassium 2 chloride ion pump in the ascending loop of Henle. And so that would be um, Lasix. And so Lasix is a strong diuretic that's potassium wasting. Uh, the other thing it could uh, do is hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, if I have a patient that's been discharged on hydrochlorothiazide, uh, what hydrochlorothiazide does is blocks the sodium chloride ion pump in that DCT. And so it's not blocking a potassium pump, but by blocking the the sodium chloride ion pump right here in the in the DCT, I increase the sodium um, in the in the in the tubule lumen, which means I'm bringing more sodium in, and that's where it becomes potassium wasting because it displaces potassium from the cell, and then I lose that. So if I'm looking here and, and it's low, you know, I want to know are they on Lasix or are they on hydrochlorothiazide? Okay, so then I look at chloride ion. <clears throat> so chloride ion. With it, a lot of times it trends with sodium. When sodium goes up, it goes up. When sodium goes down, it goes down. And the reason for that is because I'm maintaining that electrical neutrality. Now, one thing I wanna do is I always wanna get a measurement on my anion gap. And so what I'm looking at is I'm looking at to see if my uh, positive charges are balanced by my negative charges. And of course they're gonna be because you have that electrical neutrality. So my positive charges are gonna be primarily going to be sodium um, in the extracellular fluid. And then with these negative charges, it's primarily going to be chloride ion that balances it. And then it's going to be bicarbonate ion. And then lastly, it's going to be the anions, and that's the anion um, gaps. And so um, so anyway, so chloride ion for right now, for our purposes, it's, it's moving, trending with, uh, with sodium, and also uh, because of the reabsorption with sodium in the, in the, in the kidney, in the tubule lumen. Um, then I look at CO2. Now CO2 is actually an indirect measurement of bicarbonate. So the CO2 I'm looking at here is actually measured in millimoles um, per liter. Um, and so if I look at CO2 in millimoles per liter, I notice that the range is actually the same range, um, depending on the lab you're looking at, is the same range for bicarbonate. And so usually we're looking at bicarbonate being from 22 to 26 or 22 to 27. And so let's just say 22 for 27. Well, that's the same range of millimoles per liter for CO2. So I can, I can actually determine that this is an indirect uh, measurement of my bicarbonate because I know my bicarbonate, it's not measured in millimoles per liter, but it is measured in milliequivalents per liter, and it's the same range. And so, um, so this is a measure, again, of my bicarbonate. So what can cause bicarbonate to go up and down? Well, we've already dealt with that in our acid-base balancing. And so typically what's happening is when bicarbonate is going up, you're usually in a primary metabolic alkalosis state. Um, you're onboarding uh, bicarbonate. And so we talked about the Tums example where you're adding bicarbonate to the system. Um, seldom are you, well not seldom, but, but not, it's not usually that you're compensating um, with, with, um, uh, with bicarbonate, uh, but, you, but you can. Um, so let me just draw the scale here. Because if we look at our scale, we can see what's what's compensating, and then what as far as which way uh, we're trending with that. So just by way of review, I've got my scale right here. This is my H2CO3. This is my bicarbonate on this side. And so what I want to consider is when I'm looking at that CO2, I'm asking myself, um, is this increasing or decreasing? So let's look at a, a pathology where we might um, end up actually uh, increasing this side. 
And so CO2 is not the same as PCO2. PCO2 is a, ga is a measure of a gas. CO2 is an indirect measure of bicarbonate. However, if I increase PCO2, I can increase bicarbonate. And so we'll show you how that works. So let's say I have a patient that has COPD. So with COPD, what they're doing is they're retaining, um, by carb or retaining CO2. And so what's happening is that retained CO2 is, is, is producing hypercapnia. So now in this condition of hypercapnia, what happens is they're ending up with a greater PCO2. Well, as PCO2 flows through the kidneys, so I've added, and, and by the way, also as I increase residual CO2, I'm gonna add H2O and I'm gonna get H2CO3, so I'm loading it on this side of the scale. So COPD is, is getting me into that respiratory um, acidosis. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna compensate. So how the compensation takes place is like this. Is as, as CO2 uh, goes through the, um, the kidneys, it can diffuse out. So CO2 can diffuse into what's called the intercalated cells. And so the intercalated cells type A are gonna do this. I've got my CO2, I'm gonna take H2O. Now in these intercalated cells, I have carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase is gonna take those and give me H2CO3. And then with my H2CO3, I'm gonna take my hydrogen ion and I'm gonna kick it out. So I actually unloaded an acid and then what I'm gonna do with the bicarbonate is I'm gonna reabsorb that and then add that back on this side of the scale. And so I start to compensate for that. So once again, when you're looking at CO2, just realize that it is uh, bicarbonate, that you're actually an indirect measurement. And then you're just asking yourself the question, if it's, if it's high or low, what's happening on this scale and why would it be going um, high or low? On the flip side of that, you know, so here was the COPD and we're doing metabolic um, compensation. However, we looked at before at other um, ways where we're unloading the scale and that's where we get to the anion gap. So if all of a sudden your CO2 is, is trending down, uh, you have to think what's causing that downward trend. And so usually the renal mechanisms take a while uh, where you actually see changes. But if I'm in a state of diabetic ketoacidosis um, where I have the ketones and the ketones are liberating the hydrogen ion, as they liberate the hydrogen ion, I'm taking my bicarbonate and what I'm doing is I'm buffering that hydrogen ion, which gives me that H2CO3, loads it to this side of the scale, but my bicarbonate came off this side of the scale. And so in that case, I have some pretty rapid changes um, in bicarbonate because they're not being mediated by the uh, kidney at that point through the long term. They're just being uh, mediated as a buffer in, in plasma. Okay, then we look at our BUN. And so our BUN is a measure of liver function. Now, BUN uh, is usually about 10 to 20. And again, all this is, is individual based on um, the lab that's doing the readings because they'll have their norms. But usually uh, 10 to 20 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And so when I'm looking at BUN, we already showed you um, how to determine if uh, it was being hemoconcentrated or hemodiluted just by looking at the sodium and then also the hematocrit. Now, BUN typically doesn't um, increase in the absence of renal pathology, typically, but it can. And so if I've got renal pathology, um, what's taking place is my BUN is not being excreted by the kidneys and the BUN can, can start to increase. To verify that it's a renal pathology, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at creatinine because that should be increasing and then my GFR should be decreasing. So if BUN is increasing and creatinine is increasing and GFR is increasing, that's gonna tell you that that's a renal pathology and so you might have chronic kidney disease or AKI. However, there are cases where GFR is not decreasing, creatinine is not increasing, uh, but BUN is increasing. Then you have to think about another source of protein. So when I have the liver right here, I've got the portal system coming in, and all the byproducts of digestion are going through the portal system. Now, um, one of the things that happens is that this blood is being, is being uh, brought back from the intestinal tract. Well, if I take protein and put it in the intestinal tract, what happens is that protein gets uh, degraded, deaminated, broken down, and I actually form um, ammonia. And so oops, it's a three. I'm forming ammonia within um, the, the lumen, and that ammonia can, can actually enter the portal system. Now in the portal system, of course, that ammonia is gonna be converted along the urea cycle into blood urea nitrogen. 
So if my BUN is going up, but my creatinine is not, and my GFR is normal, then what I have to think of is what is my source of protein? So a lot of times what you're looking at is, is GI bleeds. And so with the GI bleed, you're having this, this constant source of protein that's, that's causing your, your urea to go up. Now, on the other hand, the BUN could go down. And so if the BUN is going down, then, that, then at that point, there's something wrong with the liver. Usually what's happening in the liver is there's fibrosis of the liver or there's hepatic portal tension. And so now what's taking place is because of the fibrosis of the liver, I'm, I'm decreasing um, the flow into the liver. And so I'm not able to get my ammonia into the liver to change it um, to the urea cycle into blood urea nitrogen. And so sometimes with hepatic encephalopathies, you'll see this where the liver is fibrotic and they have varices that have circumtutus routes back into the vena cava. Uh, the individual eat a lot of protein and then that protein is, is, you produce ammonia, but then the ammonia can't get to the liver, so it goes in the blood. And then as it circulates to the blood, it goes into the blood-brain barrier where it causes swelling of the astrocytes and the astrocytes control, control that blood-brain barrier. And then you're gonna see the uh, signs and symptoms of the hepatic encephalopathy. All right, creatinine. Creatinine is maintained at a, at a steady rate. And so when I'm looking at creatinine, um, it shouldn't vary much at all in the absence of renal pathology. And so it can, you, if you eat a large proteinous meal, it can bump it slightly, but usually it's not gonna go up unless the kidneys aren't working good. And so if, again, if creatinine is going up, BU is going up, look at the GFR, and then that should verify um, renal, uh, renal um, uh, function. Now, creatinine um, can go down. And so if creatinine is going down, sometimes what's happening is, is might be muscle wasting. Like if you have a patient that's cachexic, okay? They have uh, chronic uh, cirrhosis, they're cachexic, they're not eating, um, then I will see creatinine goes down as, as you get muscle wasting. Also, I gave you an example in, your, um, in one of your labs about the uh, myasthenia gravis. And so if there's an individual with myasthenia gravis, you're gonna start to get that, that uh, breakdown uh, because you're having um, the neuromuscular junction being folded and it's not responding to acetylcholine, you're gonna start to get atrophy of those muscles and then start to um, lose um, some of the, the protein and also the creatinine. Okay, so then glucose, when we look at glucose, glucose is just gonna give us a major, um, you know, a, a, a snapshot of where their blood glucose is at that point in time. So what we need to know is, are they preprandial or are they postprandial? So if they're preprandial, their glucose should be within that normal range with the um, average set point about 90 milligrams per deciliter. Um, now, a lot of times though, you can have a, someone that's preprandial, they haven't eaten yet, but their glucose is, is bumped up. So what you're gonna look at is you're gonna look at their hemoglobin A1C. And their hemoglobin A1C will confirm um, the, the state of hyperglycemia in that vascular system for the past um, 120 days, which is the, about the functional span of the red blood cell. Now, sometimes the hemoglobin A1C will be normal. They're, they're preprandial, they haven't eaten anything, and their glucose is high. Then you think cortisol. Because cortisol, ACTH, when it goes over to the zona fasciculata and ACTH um, stimulates the release of cortisol, cortisol goes out to the peripheral tissues, uh, especially the skeletal muscle and the lower extremities, and it causes the catabolism of those um, of the, of the muscle, it breaks down the contractile units and then you take those proteins back to the liver for gluconeogenesis and then that can kick up your um, glucose level in the absence of um, diabetes mellitus. Okay, so then we're gonna come over and look at white blood cells, platelets, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. So white blood cells, we're looking to see if they're going up. So your normal range, it, again, it depends on the lab, it might be 4.5 to 11, um, uh, thousand per milli, uh, millimeter um, of blood. And so with the white blood cells, we had the hematocrit down here at let's say 45%, this is your mel value, sorry, and then 55% of your plasma, and then your buffy coat was less than 1%, and that less than 1% was represented by thrombocytes and then white blood cells. Now, when your white blood cells are going up and down, usually what's going up and down is the neutrophils. Um, neutrophils, you usually make about 100 billion a day. And so you're making these just in this huge number um, all the time. Um, and so what you have to do is, is as fast as you uh, put them into circulation, you're also taking them out of circulation. And so neutrophils have a functional span of about five days. That's their, that's their half-life. So they have about a five-day half-life. And so every five days, it, it drops in half. 
Now, if white blood cells are going up, the first thing, of course, you think about is infection. And so uh, white blood cells are stored in trabecular bone, and so those chemotactic signals can cause the white blood cells to leave trabecular bone and go out in, in, into, the, um, uh, into circulation. And so white blood cells, what you'll do is, is if you do a differential and look at um, the never let monkeys eat bananas, the order that it should go in, um, neutrophils are usually what's trending up with active infections. If white blood cells are going up but neutrophils aren't, you look at the lymphocytes because that could tell you maybe a viral infection or some type of, uh, or something else going on. Um, if monocytes are going up, it might tell you that there's a, a, a chronic infection. If eosinophils are going up, it could be a helmuth uh, infection or you could have eosinophilia because of, 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 of maybe even allergies. Now, neutrophils, um, so they'll initially they'll trend up, but if the infection is pretty bad, um, one of the things that can happen is this, is the neutrophils are intravascular, but as we showed you in other videos, they'll actually become extravascular. So once they've marginated, or once they've left, if we're taking and, and um, taking our sample from the blood, we're not picking up the ones that have marginated or the ones that have already diapodesed. And so in some cases, what you'll see, especially in aggressive infections, you'll actually see the white blood cell numbers go down. And the reason for that is because you're killing them off and not re faster than you can replace them. And so in that case, you'll start to see an increase in what are called band cells, and that's the shift to the left. So normally you might have 95% um, mature neutrophils, the polymorphic nuclear leukocytes, but then only 5% band cells. But in these shifts to the left, it might go 85% uh, neutrophils and then 15% um, uh, band cells. And then if you're not, if, if the infection is really aggressive and they're, and they're dying off, then of course, what you're gonna see is the, these, this number start to drop and, that, and that's not a, not a really good uh, sign. Um, the other thing is, is neutrophils, um, they'll actually, uh, after about five days, uh, they don't wait out here to undergo apoptosis. They'll actually travel back to the bone, trabecular bone, and then also the liver and the spleen um, to be phagocytized uh, by the splenic macrophages, um, the uh, sinusoidal macrophages, and then also the, the follicular cell or the cells, macro, uh, phagocytic cells within the bone marrow. All right, when we're looking at, um, at hemoglobin and hematocrit, a lot of times these numbers will go up and down either based upon fluid because I can again hemoconcentrate or hemodilute um, and so sometimes what you'll see is with congestive heart failure with CHF there's so much fluid on board that both of these um, are trending down and so you want to look at your BNPs to see if that's the case of the trending down. So if your BNP is at 3,000, 4,000, then these are definitely being hemodiluted. In other cases, your BNP might be normal, it would be less than 100 and these are going down. Uh, then what you're thinking about is things like bleeding or hemorrhaging or anemias. And so anything that's causing um, the loss of those, uh, of those components. And then of course, you're, you get down to your critical values, usually you're gonna think about transfusing at a, at a at a hemoglobin of seven, and then your critical value, of course, is five. Is about is a hemoglobin about five. Um, another thing that can cause this to go down is CKD, because um, in CKD, the mesangial cells or the mesangium is is the likely source of EPO. And so, if I have chronic kidney disease, I don't have good circulation into the kidney, but I also don't have good circulation out of the kidney, and so my erythropoietin levels are dropping, and since they're dropping, the rate of erythropoiesis is dropping, which is causing hemoglobin and hematocrit um, also levels to drop. Um, another thing that can actually um, decrease your white blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and your platelets is something like splenomaglia. Because in splenomaglia, what's happening is here's my liver, I've got my hepatic portal system, um, usually there's something, there might be fibrosis of the liver, but that's taking all the blood that's being drained um, from the stomach, from the spleen, and from the pancreas, or, or yeah, from the, from the stomach, spleen, and pancreas, and it's backing that uh, blood up into the spleen. The spleen becomes engorged, and the macrophages do what macrophages do. They start to break down um, these different things, and all of these um, levels can drop. And so when the platelets are going down, you want to think, okay, is there, is there a liver pathology that's causing splenomaglia? Is there a primary splenomaglia? It could be a thing called idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenia. And so idiopathic thrombocytopenia, um, what you have is you have um, idiopathic, they don't know why, uh, thrombocytopenia, 
um, is just penia few thrombocytes, and then it's purpura, so ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, and purpura is the, is the bruising um, that you will uh, get in association with that. Anyway, so that's just kind of an a introduction into uh, one way to approach it. I'm sure that from the bedside, your bedside experience, you have lots of different ways um, to approach it and how you're evaluating these things. My encouragement to you, and, and, and the, one of the goals of this class, is to look at it at, at a more cellular level. And so we're looking at, you know, at the zona glomerulosa and the chemical signaling within that. We're going to look at the, the chemical um, signaling within the, the, the tubules. Because once we understand this process, um, we can start to add our pharmacology and see how pharmacology either increases or decreases these signaling um, pathways. All right, um, that's it, and then we'll have another, uh, uh, follow this up with a video where we're going to give you uh, a serum metabolic panel, and we'll just kind of work through it together and, and practice it. Okay, if, once again, if you have questions, just email me.